And good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode three of Cue the Memories, presented by Coors Banquet. I am your host, Eric Russo. So happy to be joined by two Bruins legends, Mr. Rick Middleton and Mr. Terry O'Reilly. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. So we have lots of questions about hockey, but our gracious <laughs> hosts here at the Kowloon, we have to start with them. I know both of you have a history here. Rick, we'll start with you. Is there a favorite Kowloon story over the years that you'd like to tell? About coming here? I've, yeah. I've been coming here since 1977. And um, my friend Bobby Wong, the waiter, uh, was just here. And he's going on his 50th year. He started in 75. So I've brought all my kids here for their birthdays over the years. I've been here for a few of my own. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's always been a, a family tradition to come to Kowloon's. And the Wong family has just been so generous and so great to myself and my family over the years. I'm so sad to hear that it's, it's coming to an end soon. But uh, uh, they're going to keep it, I, I hear, a smaller version of Kowloon's, and I hope so. You breaking some news there? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> as long as they serve uh, uh, Mai Tais and... Uh, well, you fog have a, you have a favorite drink, don't you? Fog cutter, yes. I've been I've been drinking fog cutter since 1977, and uh, <laughs> they haven't changed much. <laughs> Taz, what about you? Any Kowloon memories from over the years? Oh, nothing in particular, but just very, very fond memories of uh, everybody that works here. Bobby, uh, I remember when he had his uh, little girl. He brought her in. She was like three years old. And uh, saw her a few years later. She was in elementary school, then high school, and and now I hear she's working for the Bruins. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. maybe inspired by you. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so Terry, I want to start with you with the hockey questions. Now you were a goalie growing up. Tell us how the. <laughs> laugh. How did you stop being a goalie, and why did you stop being a goalie? I stopped being a goalie when I realized I had a gift for scoring goals. We were playing St. Mary's, which was the best team in the church league. I was playing for St. Gertrude's goalie for the worst team. And uh, we were, no, actually it was the reverse. We were better than St. Mary's. So we, we carried the play in their end the whole game. Like they didn't get one shot on our net until near the end of the game. We're trying to score, but their goalie was outstanding, stopping everything. And at one point, the puck got knocked down along the boards, and it's coming into our end, where the ice is pristine. <laughs> and I'd been watching the Toronto Maple Leafs, how the goalie would come out and set the puck up for his skaters to come back and pick it up. So I skated out of my net, and I put my stick down as the puck was coming along on this pristine ice. And it hit my goalie stick on an angle, and now it's heading for an open net. And you, you people saw me skate in the NHL. I was much worse when I was eight years old with goalie pads on. And I'm, so I started running after this puck. And about 10 feet bef before the net, I jump on it and I pull it in. And I'm looking at the referee and he's got the whistle in his mouth and he's got his hand and he's pointing and I'm sliding. And he doesn't blow the whistle till I cross that line. We, we lost that game one nothing and... <laughs> I was a forward after that. <laughs> so I grew up in Everett, and I've heard stories that you were playing street hockey with my dad and my uncle back in the day. So where did the bond with the fans start? Was that, was that where it started when you were playing street hockey with, with the local people back in the day? I, I was only uh, 19 years old, and I grew up playing street hockey. And uh, I met a bunch of the uh, boys in Everett, and... Joe Bucchino, the, the Bucchino family, uh, he ended up becoming a stick boy for the Bruins. He ended up moving to New York and uh, working for Phil Esposito. But at the time, we, we got out in the street and played street hockey just about every chance we could. And then you rode your bike down into, into Boston, right? I, I had a, well, it was a, probably a 12-speed back then. And I lived on the third floor of an apartment building in Everett, and... If I wanted, if the Bruins were playing an afternoon game, 
I was playing for the Braves. I would I had a hook and a rope. I would lower the bike down to the parking lot, <laughs> and I'd run down before somebody stole it. And I would ride in on Route 99 uh, into the Boston Garden. I would go up the ramp, show the security guard my ID, and uh, watch the Bruins play, and then I'd ride my bike home. So it was memories. No bikes have ever been stolen in Everett. Come on. <laughs> Rick, when did, when did your bond with the fans start? Obviously, you come via trade in 76. Uh, did it start pretty much immediately from that? Well, you know, to me, I, I started in New York with the Rangers, you know, and you're downtown, Madison Square Gardens, and, and the fans are all over the place, but you're kind of not seen in New York. I get to Boston, and no matter where you went, they knew who you were because you didn't wear helmets in those days. So the bond with the fans happened right away. I lived downtown Boston. I, I, I got right into the, the whole thing about being a Bruin, living in Boston, being a Bostonian. But uh, I don't know. It's just uh, we do a lot of, I wouldn't call it charity work, but you're always, uh, we played charity baseball games in the summer. Uh, you know, after the career with the alumni for 30 years, doing games in all the communities for all different charities. So, uh, you know, and Terry can attest to it. The, the Bruins have always been in the community, uh, even before the foundation and everything, uh, going back to Milt Schmidt and Woody Dumart and, and all these guys in the past, never got a lot of advertisement, but the Bruins have always been in the community. And the players were always willing to do whatever they were asked to do, and uh, without you know reading it on uh, YouTube or you know fa Facebook or anything in those days, you didn't, you didn't hear about it. Tell us about your first meeting with Don Cherry that that training camp. <laughs> well, that was a funny story. Um, Don and I knew of each other because he was the coach of the Rochester Americans, and I started my first year uh, with the Rangers in, with their farm team, which was right down the road in Providence. They were called the Providence Reds in those days, the Rhode Island Reds. Very first year, they built the Civic Center, the, the Duncan Center, whatever it's called now. Uh, so he was the coach of Rochester. I was playing in Providence, and we, we had a couple of interactions uh, at games. Johnny Winsink was his... Uh, Tough guy in those days, so you can imagine some of the games got a little, little hairy. But um, so in uh, 76, when I got traded here, uh, my, I remember the my very first day I went in and met, you know, I already knew Brad Park and Jean Rattel from the Rangers and met a lot of the other guys. So I wake up, walk on the ice or skate on the ice. I'm just loosening up, skating around. I, I, I think I was with Wayne Cashman, Peter McNabb, and Bobby Schmott. And Don came over uh, to greet me and took his glove off and stuck his hand out. And my memory of it is he said, hey, Ricky boy. He always called me Ricky boy for some reason. I don't know. And he goes, you're looking a little bigger this year. Uh, you've been working out? And I, I just looked at him. I said, no, Don, I just had a good summer. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to remember... <laughs> Training camp in those days was to go, get into shape. You do two a days for three weeks. You don't play any games, and so you know I might have been. He said I was 20 pounds overweight. I don't think so. Maybe five <laughs> or six. But Bobby Smotz was laughing so hard he fell on the ice. And I knew I, I knew I was in trouble from then on. That's the first time I saw Don Cherry speechless. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the last time. <laughs> you ended up having a pretty good first game with the Bruins after that, though. Well, uh, thankfully, he played me on a line with Jean Rattel, who's, who's here for, uh, for this uh, celebration, and Johnny Busick. Uh, so the two Hall of Famers, and I always said, uh, you know, I got a hat trick my first game, and who wouldn't if you're playing with those two guys? But I ended up with three in my first game and 20 on the whole season because Don basically benched me the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> he platooned me, let's put it that way. He dressed me, but he wouldn't play me regular, so... Terry, what about you? What was your rapport with, with Don like? I, I loved the guy. He was, uh, he was a player's coach, very loyal, very defensive of the players. If we had a bad game, uh, he wouldn't critique us with the media. You know, we'd hear it one-on-one -on -one in the uh, coach's office or else we'd, he'd skate us to death on, on the ice, you know. He, he had what we called Black Tuesdays. 
traditionally the game would be two games on the weekend, Saturday, Sunday. Then he had a Monday a day off, Tuesday a hard workout, Wednesday a lighter, lighter workout, game on Thursday, game on Saturday, game on Sunday. So Tuesday was, you know, he would punish us. <laughs> you know, and you know, he just had a smile on his face. And we were up and down, over and back. So, But everybody, would, they would have fallen on their swords for him. And you guys were following Bobby Orr, Phil Esposito, the big bad Bruins. That, that could have been tough, but his personality and, and the identity of your team and the way you guys played, how do you think that helped keep the Bruins relevant after the icons left town, really? Rick, you can start with that. <laughs> well, don't... He's saying we're not icons. <laughs> <laughs> you became icons. Thanks to Don. No, but... Um, no, one of the funny stories is we were the biggest draw on the road, and mainly because of Don Cherry's mouth, you know. So <laughs> we'd go into a town, and, and we were, like, in first place or pretty close to it, and always very competitive. And But we'd go into cities, and they'd always, the press in that city would always want to get a, a byline from Don the night before the game. So the one, the one I remember is... We went into Denver to play the Colorado Rockies, and we were, like, in first place in our division. They were in last place in their division, so they asked them, they said, how, how do you get your team up for a game against the lowly Rockies? I mean, how do you motivate them? And Don said, well, he says, I'm just going to tell them to wear their left skate tomorrow night. <laughs> well, don't you know that's in the paper the next day, and he's, they got it pinned up in the dressing room? I, I do believe there was a brawl that night. But that was done. Yep. Yep. And then come playoff time that, that first year, you were talking about this a little earlier, you weren't getting all the playing time, but in that playoff series, you, you had a pretty big goal. Well, uh, actually, the two of us had big goals. It was against Philadelphia, the Broad Street Bullies. They were ahead of us, so we had played the first two games in Philly. And again, in, in the semifinals, and... Uh, I hadn't been playing regular in the playoffs, but I, I, I was playing in the game, but not regular. So it went into overtime in the first game, and, and I'm loosening my skates up in the dressing room, I remember, so my feet don't fall asleep. And he comes over and he leans down to me. He says, uh, you're going to get the winner. So I look up at him. I said, so I must be playing, right? <laughs> <laughs> in my usual sarcastic way. And he just scowled at me. And, but I did end up getting the winner. He was prophetic with, at that against so Bernie Perrant, the great goalie from, from Philly. We won the first game. Second game went into double overtime. And this guy scored in, in double overtime in the second game. And we came home and, won, and beat him four straight. And that was basically the end of the Broad Street Bullies. But unfortunately, we played Montreal after that, and they beat us four straight. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like to have to go through Montreal all the time and, and that sort of curse hanging over things for a while? What was the pressure like in that regard, Taz? It was depressing. <laughs> <laughs> but the rivalry was still great at the same time, even though they, they were beating you in the playoffs. How can it be great? <laughs> How can it be great if they're beating us all the time? <laughs> in the in hindsight, he means take that hat off right now. <laughs> Switching gears a little bit nifty to your uh, centerman, Barry Peterson. I, I feel like uh, he's maybe one of the more underrated players in Bruins history. What can you for, talk about what he meant sure. to your career? Uh, like everything. Uh, you know, like I said, in, in, in Boston when I started, uh, even though it was my third year in the league, I, I didn't play regular. Then I got a lot more ice time in 78, and by 79 I was playing regular. Don had me on a, on a great line uh, with Jean Rattel and, and Stan Jonathan, and my numbers went up. But by the time it rolled into the 80s, Jerry Cheevers became coach, and he basically made me kind of his go-to guy. He was playing me uh, power play, penalty killing. I, I never did all that. In the 70s with Don, he had other guys that would do most of that. And uh, my, then the, this young kid uh, got drafted, came to the camp, made it right out of camp his first year. And Cheesy put us together and we just clicked right away. And 
you know, it's you can't explain it. It's just he'd always be able to find me on the ice, and the Boston Garden ice wasn't that big, so it's not hard to find. But he could read me, and I read him. I mean, and it just happened. We we didn't plan it. We didn't really work on a lot. We just kind of knew where we liked. I always liked to get the puck because the, the center ice was there wasn't much room there, and if you didn't get your head up in time, it could be detrimental to your health. So <laughs> he'd get me the puck before center ice, so I could get my head up on the defenseman and such. And so we just we just clicked, and, and uh, we had our first year. We had a left winger by the name of Mike Kruzelinski, and, and we had a, a really good line. And Mike's in town, uh, so I'm, I'm, what I'm looking forward to is I, I have my line from the '80s here. And I have Jean Rattel and Stan Jonathan, my line from the 70s. So I'm looking forward to getting pictures with both. That's yeah. awesome. So, you know, obviously the prolific scoring for yourself, but you win the Lady Bing in 82. But you don't have that trophy, do you? <laughs> How do you know that story? <laughs> you told me it once. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a long story, so I'll shorten it. But, um, yes, I was at Pebble Beach in 1982. I had won the first Star Award, and they, they gave a, a trip away, and I took a couple of buddies to Pebble Beach. And I got a phone call at Pebble Beach that, from the NHL saying, congratulations, you've won the Lady Bing Award. And I was like, in, out, of, out of this world, it was my first NHL award. And as it turned out, my last. <laughs> it, was only, it was the only one I won. But then in their next breath, they said, we'd like you to come to Montreal next weekend to, to accept it. I'm like, next weekend? <laughs> I'm, I'm at Pebble Beach, and I was going to Vegas for the Holmes-Cooney fight. <laughs> so that. so I, I said, I'm sorry. I, I, it took me months to put this trip together. Anyway, long story short, I never went. My father went to Montreal to accept it. Uh, it wasn't televised in those days. And I went home to get it, and it was this little plaque like this. And I was like, this is it? That? I, mean, I was expecting a big trophy. It was a little plaque. And I took it home, and, and I shown it to somebody, and there was a, they had a puck in it. It said NHL, and the puck fell out. It started bouncing on the hardwood. <laughs> so I threw it in the garbage. <laughs> I don't have it today. I threw it in the garbage. So make another long story short, few, years later, I'm at the All-Star Game in Montreal. I'm in a bar having a beer with Rod Langway, the great defenseman. And I told him the story, and he goes, 82, 82. He says, yeah, I won the Norris in 82. I got one of those plaques. I go, what? He goes, oh, yeah. They, so last year, they gave those crappy little plaques. The next year, they gave big trophies like that. <laughs> I said, I know, because I had to give Mike Bossy one the next year. I was the presenter. So anyway, it's a funny story. But I don't have it today. <laughs> Terry, I don't think you have any Lady Bings to your name either. <laughs> but where did the fighting and the toughness sort of come from? Because... You were a prolific scorer yourself, but where did the toughness and the fighting part of it come prolific from? Prolific scorer. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you. Uh, I had four brothers and an uh, Irish family, and we had to scrap for everything. You know, we were positioned in front of the TV for Hockey Night in Canada on Saturday night or Bonanza on Sunday night. <laughs> had to fight for your seat. Uh, it was just a natural progression. Uh, and in the NHL at that time, if you body check somebody hard, it's almost like their gloves were spring loaded. They popped off and they wanted to fight you. So a lot of my fights were a result of me body checking somebody. They, they wanted to fight. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So it's taken, I don't know, 20 minutes or here. We haven't talked about the fun at Madison Square Garden that night. So <laughs> everybody here remembers that, I think. So take us through it, how it started, and what you remember from it. Well, my official story is the puck went over the glass and I was pursuing it. <laughs> but... In reality, uh, we, were, we were leaving the ice. We'd won the game. December 23rd, we got a plane waiting at the airport to take us back. We got three days off for Christmas. Got food and drinks on the plane. We just won on the road. We want to get out of town. And the Rangers were very frustrated. Phil Esposito had a breakaway in the last seconds of the game. I don't even think he got a shot on the net. No, Cheesy stopped him. Yeah. Anyway... 
Phil breaks his stick on the ice, and uh, they're very frustrated. We're trying to leave the ice. We have to go by their bench to leave the ice. They start milling around, pushing and shoving, and Stan Jonathan got tied up with a ranger player right by the side glass, which was only two feet high. And while he's tied up with this guy, this big fan reached over. He had a program in his hand, but he reached over and smacked Stan in the face. And Stan covered with his stick, and the guy pulled the stick out of his hands and started swinging it back and forth over the glass. And I was maybe five feet to the left. So I, I, think, I thought, you know, this guy's going to just disappear into the crowd with Stan's stick after assaulting him. So I said, I'm going to stop him from leaving. <laughs> <laughs> but he wasn't alone. So I, I got over the glass and got him into a good full Nelson. I got it. Arms, my, my hands are locked behind his head. I'm bending him down in half. You're just holding him down for security. Oh, yes, yes. yes. But he, he was with two other guys, and they're beating the daylights out of me. So, And then all of a sudden, the punching stopped, and I popped my head up, looked around. I, had, I always felt like Tom Brady. I was in a pocket. I had, I had 20 hockey players, Bruins, surrounding me, protecting me. And, uh, and then Mike Milbury chased one of them two sections up, and... The guy fell over a seat and kicked at Mike, and Mike caught his foot, and the shoe came off, and that's, that's the famous shoe incident. <laughs> the hush puppy incident. Yeah. Rick, what do you remember? What was your vantage point of that whole thing? <laughs> well, the funny thing was that as soon as Cheesy stopped Phil, we won the game. I jumped over the boards, I tapped Cheesy on the pads, and the Zamboni doors were right there, so I skated off. <laughs> Cheesy skated off, and Mike Melberry skated off. So we're walking, this is my memory of it anyways, we're walking to the dress room on a little carpet, and it's a long walk back, and I don't know, we're halfway to the dress room, we hear the fans going nuts, we turn around, there's nobody coming. So we ran back out. <laughs> Maybe not Cheesy, but Mike and I ran back out. <laughs> And by the time we got back out, everybody was already in the stands. <laughs> we had no clue what happened. So I look over here, and they already had this guy down over here. I didn't see the guy up here because what happened when he came down turned out to be the guy's brother. He saw Peter McNabb going over. He ran back up the stairs, and McNabb grabbed him and threw him between the seats. But Milbury just kept running up the stairs. He had no clue what happened. He didn't know. He just know something must have happened. And, and he couldn't get a shot at him, so he took his shoe off and he started hitting him with it. And that was about it. Nobody was hospitalized. Nobody was caught. They actually sued the Bruins and nine co-defendants, and it got thrown out of court in New York because you're under every right to protect yourself because the guy took the stick to start. But the camera never showed it, so everybody thought Terry just didn't like that guy. It went over again. <laughs> But they, the camera never showed him hitting Stan and grabbing the stick, and that's what precipitated everything. So besides the fans in the stands, who was the toughest guy you ever fought in the NHL? Uh, it'd be my brother Dave or my brother Bill. <laughs> but on the ice, uh, I had a lot of scraps with Dave Schultz. He, he wasn't a particularly good fighter, but he was very willing. <laughs> So, and very unlikable at the time. <laughs> so I had a lot of scraps with him. The guy that gave me the, probably the best beating was Clark Gillies. You know, he really tuned me up. So I had stitches in seven different places when he was finished. I had both eyebrows, my nose, my lip, three places on my knuckles. <laughs> it, was, it was a mess. <laughs> But he came back and fought him again. <laughs> so when you're fighting those guys so much, was there any sort of rapport off the ice? Like, were you friendly? Did you hate each other off the ice, too? What was it like in those days as far yeah, as that we'd goes? we'd barbecue in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, never, never communicated with them until later. I, I heard that Clark uh, had become very sick, and so I reached out to his family to wish him the best. But he, had, he passed away shortly after that, so unfortunately, he's too far, far too young. What do you think about the state of, of fighting in today's game? Obviously, there's not much of it, but, but what do you think of how much it's decreased since, since your days? I don't think it's a bad thing. It's, uh, 
uh, I think that the objective has been uh, to weed it out of the game, but slowly so that they don't change the complexion of the game too much. Because what you want, I mean, we're all hockey fans in here. When you have two guys willing to drop their gloves and beat each other up, that's what you want is that level of intensity. You don't want necessarily the fight, but you want them to be that intense and directed into playing. And I think that the NHL has done a good job of, of you know, they, they gradually increase the penalties and add suspensions and, and weed it out. And, and the intensity gets transferred into checking hard, skating hard, competing hard. And that's what you want. Now, you, you sold yourself short earlier about your scoring, but you were part of the 11, 20 goal scorers in 77, 78. What was so special about that team? And, and both of you can take this one, Rick. Maybe you can start. Um, what made you guys so good and to have 11, 20 goal scorers that year, which is a record still? Well, you know, Don called us the lunch pail AC gang, uh, really just to, it was a, a compliment because we were a bunch of hardworking guys that came to work every day, kind of blue collar, really related to the fans, kind of. But we had a very talented team. I mean, we got it to the Stanley Cup Finals a year before and lost to a powerhouse that sent nine guys to the Hall of Fame. And we were playing them the next year, and that was 78. And we had uh, a, a, a good team again that year. And uh, we thought we could, we could beat Montreal. And it just turned out, and I, I don't know how many of the guys were aware that going into Toronto in the last game of the year that we had a chance to set the record. Uh, and it just, well, you know the story. So you want me to tell them? Yeah. That's what we're here All for. All right. Well, story we're in time. Toronto, and I've never, and I don't know if you remember it. You probably remember it well. But I've never seen it my whole life. I've been in hockey over 60 years that it, it, we were up by a goal. The Toronto Maple Leafs pulled the goalie, and they iced the puck. And so the, the face-off went back in their zone. So Don Cherry, being aware that uh, not only that if we, if we got the 11-20 goal scorer, he wanted Bobby Miller on the ice. Bobby, I heard, had a bonus for 20 goals, and he had 19. So he made sure Bobby was on the ice, but they never put their goalie back in. I'd never seen it. Do you remember that? It was, they never put their goalie in. So obviously, we win the draw, boom, over to Bobby Miller in the net, NHL record, and 40 years later, over 40 years later now. But I, I was, I, we have a plaque, and I had it in my office, and I was just having a look at it one day, and it was in 2018, and I did some quick math, I went, geez, that was 40 years ago. And, and I knew it was still a record, so I called Cam up, and I told him, he wasn't aware of it, he goes, oh, we gotta have a reunion. So that's what happened, they were nice enough to, to bring all the guys in, including Don Cherry. Wayne Cashman was the only guy that couldn't make it in. And uh, it's still a record over 40 years later, and I don't think it's ever going to be broken. Terry, what do you remember about that team and, and the skill and, and the offense that you guys were able to bring as well? Well, I, when I think of that team, not just that year, those, those years, that period, I have to give all the credit to Don Cherry. He, he made everybody feel like they're an equal part of the team. You know, like a musketeer, all for one, one for all. Everybody got ice time. If if we had a good lead, he would pull the uh, first and second line back a little bit, play the third and fourth line a little bit more, throw the extra defensemen out there, give them some ice time. He he, he was just a, a wizard at keeping everybody in the game and, and feeling part of the team. So. so you both have iconic nicknames. So nifty. Tell us where that came from. Well, it, it's the one that stuck. I had other ones in New York, but they didn't follow me. <laughs> but Don, uh, no, Don, Don, Jerry Cheevers claims that he gave me the nickname. So I, I always gave him credit because I really don't know else. What, you know, uh, I always thought maybe it was printed in the paper or somebody picked up on it. But the, the one thing I really liked about it, you know, kind of hanging around all those years, I was working with Nesson in the early 2000s uh, with Catherine Tappan, and she called me Nifty on, on the show. And then I'd have little eight-year-olds running around Boston Garden going, hey, Nifty, how you doing? You know, so, 
it, it's nice that that nickname continued through generations. And uh, I just sign my name Nifty now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and Taz, where did that come from? Phil Esposito. He, one day we were, uh, I think it was training camp, because we were doing double workouts, and uh, we'd have a water break halfway in between the practice. Everybody would go over to the boards. The trainers would line up water bottles on the dasher, and, and we'd get a two- or three-minute break. And I was, that was my first year, and I still had to work on my skating a little bit. So when the guys were drinking water, I, I stayed out and I did some circles and some stops and starts and, and I was doing that and then I came flying over and Phil was standing there, I came flying over and, and did a double stop and threw some snow up on him, you know, just to, you know, and he's waving it off. He says, you know, you're crazy, you know, you don't stop. You know, you're just like that, that Tasmanian devil, that's what I'm gonna call you. That's, that was it, Taz. And the rest is history. So, uh, in addition to both of you having iconic nicknames, you're both in the rafters at TD Garden. Thank you. So, Thank you. Taz, you, you came first in that regard. What do you remember about the call you got and how it happened and how you found out your number was going to go into the rafters? Well, it was... Uh, I was... I was building... Uh, a, a five-story building in Salisbury, Mass. Uh, an old hotel that I was renovating. And I was up on top building what I call a crow's nest, an octagonal room. I had somebody passing four by eight sheets of plywood up to me and, and I was putting them in place and I had a nail gun and a compressor and, doo -doo -doo -doo, and my phone rang. It was Harry Sinden. And he said, Terry, uh, I was wondering if you could... Uh, come in uh, to my office, I, I want to talk to you about something, and, and I'm, I'm working, you know. <laughs> and I said, Harry, I, I'm in the middle of this big project. I'm, I'm 60 feet in the air, and, uh, you know, why don't you drive out here and have a look at what I'm doing? You know, I'll buy you lunch, and uh, we can talk. So, well, you know, I, I wanted to talk to you about retiring your number. I'll, I'll be right in, Harry, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> And that ended up being a, a pretty special evening for you. What do you oh, remember from was, that night? It was. My uh, two sons were on the ice with me. Yeah, it was nice. And Rick, what do you remember about the call you got? Um, totally floored me. Caught me off guard. It was in July, uh, 30 years after I retired. <laughs> you know, so really wasn't what I was thinking about. And, and being the president of the uh, Bruins alumni, Cam and I would talk from time to time, and he, he might call me and had a question or whatever. So it wasn't out of the realm of possibility that he was calling me to, to ask me something about the alumni. So we miss each other. I called him back. I finally got him. We had a little small talk. You know, how's your summer going, this and that. And then he, he just blurted it out. He says, well, we've decided that we're going to retire your number 16. And I, I didn't think I heard him right. I went, what? <laughs> And, he, and I actually got emotional, and uh, my wife came home a couple minutes later and thought somebody had died, the look on my face. Like, no, really, after, after all that time, and, you know, I've always said that I think it's the greatest honor that an athlete can have is to have his number of jersey retired in the, in the town that he played, if not all his career, most of his career in. And, uh, and to this day, I just, you know, we're in our alumni suite, and I look up, and I, I can't believe it's... Uh, I'm up there beside this guy and all those other great players. And then, you know. <laughs> after all that time, uh, you know, I had noticed that nobody had worn it in a couple of years. Some, <laughs> but, you know, that's, there's never a rhyme or reason to these things. I mean, this guy, he, he retired in like 84 and they didn't do it till 2001. I'm like, what's taking them so long? <laughs> you know? But, you know, I'm just so thankful that Cam, you know, we played together my last two years in Boston. Actually, uh, his first year, we were on the same line together. I played left wing, he played right wing. So we, we had that relationship, and, and that counts for a lot when you, when you played with somebody that gets into that position, and he re they remember you as the player you were. And I'm just always thankful that he did that. 
You mentioned Cam, but let's talk about Ray Bork as well. You were co-captains with Ray. What mm. made him such a special player and person as well off the ice? Well, you know, it, <laughs> He he came in here as an 18-year-old kid, and, and as soon as he came in, like we just knew that he was the real deal. And, and what was great about him, he, you know, he had all this press and everything, but he, he didn't buy into it. He didn't act like he was going to be the next Bobby Orr. And what the great thing about Ray is he just developed his own game. And it took him a little time, you know. He only was on, what, 19 All-Star games? <laughs> But uh, he, he gradually grew into who he became. And, and that, that's only over longevity, you know, 20 years in Boston. And, and unfortunately, he never won a cup here, but it, it wasn't because he didn't try to make it happen. And then when I got, uh, you know, the honor of being named the co-captain with him, it was, it was awesome that, I think you did that, didn't you? Yes, yeah, thank you, Terry. <laughs> See what I mean about knowing guys and playing with them? They take care of you. <laughs> but, no, it was, that was my first great honor to be a, a, a captain. And you look at all the guys before and since, and there's not that many over the 100-year uh, you know, anniversary of the Boston Bruins, and I'm just so proud to be one of them. Terry, tell us about that and naming them captains and also having the chance to coach Ray as well. Well, I... Needed to uh, uh, pick somebody as a captain, and I knew Ray was the cornerstone of the of the franchise. But he was very young, and I knew that Nifty had the respect of everybody in the dressing room, and he had the experience and 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 the balanced decision making as far as when to have a team party, things like that. <laughs> But it's important, especially on the road. Oh, definitely. But I, I thought, you know, if, if they're co-captains, Nifty can tutor Ray as to what the ground rules are and how to deal with different situations. And then a couple, I think it was two years you played, eh, after that? Uh, three. Three. Uh, and then he retired and Ray slid into the uh, sole position as captain. I thought it worked out well. What was it like for you to become coach after you were playing, and how did that sort of happen? Uh, I got a call from Harry. He, he said he was thinking of firing Butch Goring, and I said, Harry, are you thinking of asking me to coach? <laughs> I, I said, I, I, I've never looked at the game from that perspective. I've always looked at the game for what I have to do as far as training, practicing, diet, everything, rest, sleep, I don't know anything about the group exercises, you know. So, so uh, he asked me. He said, "Well, actually, I recommended Jim Schoenfeld, who had coached in Buffalo and had just been fired, uh, but I knew that it was in his blood. He wanted to coach, so I suggested him. And he said, "Well, maybe I'll give him a call and try to set up an interview. But in the meantime, we've got a game in Quebec, and I need somebody behind the bench." Would you act as interim coach? So I went up with the team and we won five nothing, <laughs> and I signed a three-year contract. <laughs> so. And what was this guy like to coach? Oh, difficult, difficult. You know. <laughs> I had to search every bar on the road <laughs> at closing time, but. I managed to find them. Keep the guys yeah. loose. That's I knew what, that's what a captain does. I knew. I knew from from my play, playing experience. I knew all the places where I could find them. <laughs> and Nifty, how was Taz as a coach to you? Well, you know, I I played under Jerry Cheevers, a, a former teammate, and now I'm playing with uh, under another teammate uh, of mine. And. Uh, Terry coached the way he played, a lot of seriousness. Um, you, how would I put it? He expected you not to play like him, but you, he expected to play at a level that was a very high level of hockey. And, you know, if we played at that level, we would win. And if somebody was trying to take advantage of another teammate or whatever, you better be there to protect them and, and back them up. And that's the way he played. That's the way his team played, 
And then by 88, we went to the Stanley Cup Finals again. And I was the only guy left on the team from those 70s uh, teams that lost to Montreal. Except for him, he was the coach and I was the player. And I, we remembered that. And then going playing Montreal in the, in the uh, quarterfinals that year and finally beating them in the first time in 45 years, <laughs> Bruins him. And, and he was the coach and I was there. And then since then, I think the Bruins have won more series against Montreal than Montreal has, so. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I remember, I remember uh, standing behind the bench looking at the clock. Uh, and there was like, we were two goals up, and there was 24 seconds left. And I'm thinking, I still have time. <laughs> <laughs> I was the same way because oh, yeah. I, I had torn some cartilage in my knee the game before, and I couldn't play in game five. I couldn't skate. For, and I'm, I'm in my, I wanted to play in it so bad because we were up three games to one. <laughs> this is our chance. And I'm in the stands in my suit. And you're right, there was three minutes to go. We were up by two goals. I was still nervous. <laughs> and then Cam scored to make it 4-1. And I went, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And it was so awesome. It was great. Became more of a rivalry after that, right? <laughs> uh, I read that Taz used to jump in the drills with you guys when he was a coach, too. Is that, is that true? Jump in what? In the drills and do the drills with you guys during practice. Oh, yeah. Well, he always liked to stay out after practice, and he wouldn't give the guys the puck. <laughs> they call it two pass. And uh, you stay out on the ice, and, uh, you know, and the guys love to do it with him. I didn't, because I liked to have the puck, too. And he wouldn't give it to me. So, but, uh, yeah, he'd always be... He, he never lost the player in him. Just because he became the coach, he, he still was the player. It was, it was a good uh, drill for players that didn't play much. Are there any uh, youth hockey coaches here? Yeah. Uh, a couple. Uh, two, uh, two pass is a little game that you play below the top of the face-off circles. So you're going from there to the net. The goalie's neutral. You have two guys against two, and you have to make two passes between each other before you're allowed to shoot at the net. If you don't have a goalie, you have to hit the goalpost. So, so you make two quick passes, take a shot, and whoever recovers the puck, take two passes, make a shot. And it's a real quick uh, skill game uh, teaching you to go from defense to offense. You know, you're defending against the two guys trying to get to the net. You take the puck away from them, now you're on offense immediately. So it was a, it was a real good skill game for guys that were sitting at the end of the bench during the game. Uh, <laughs> kept, them, kept them sharp. And uh, did he do that with the alumni team too, those drills? or when you... We never practiced. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the alumni. But, uh, well, no, but he did like to have the puck. <laughs> and, and, and Terry would play defense. And uh, one of the funny stories, we used to go up into the Maritimes a lot. And I remember one, one game, he, he, he sat beside me in the dressing room, and he turns to me and goes, I don't think I'm going to make it tonight. I'm, I'm not feeling very good. I, I feel lousy. I, I think I might have a fever. So I, I, I might have, I'm going to go out and try it. And if I feel lousy, I'm, I'm coming in, getting undressed. I said, all right. So... We go out in the ice. Next thing you know, he's up and down the ice with the puck. He played the whole game. <laughs> You're feeling better. <laughs> feeling better. The ice does that to me. <laughs> <laughs> How special was it for you to, to head the alumni for so long and be able to coordinate that and, and have so many of the older Bruins come back and, and stay involved with the organization? Well, um, when I got involved with it, Johnny Busick was running it. And uh, we just saw it. Uh, grow from there right around the, uh, 2000. Uh, Terry, we had a big meeting here with all the alumni, and we decided we wanted to expand the alumni, uh, mainly due to Terry bringing everybody together. And we decided to run it as a board. And we, we were so lucky to have so many guys that live in the area. Uh, at one time, I had like 40 guys on the list that we could ask to play in games. And we do 30 games a year normally. Uh, 30 different charities, 30 different hockey rinks all over in the middle of winter, driving yourself there. It's a big commitment from a lot of guys, but uh, I can never remember as president not having a full team show up for a game. And uh, you know, yeah. So it's a credit to all the guys. That, and again, you know, you know we, we do have a website now. We're on social media quite <laughs> a lot more than we used to, to be. 
Uh, and and now you, you even have you know uh, Chara playing and Bergeron played his first game the other night. So it, it's all about raising money for the charities. And I was just proud to you know Bobby Sweeney started as president. He went to the foundation, and I moved up as vice president for 15 years, and I was proud to do it. And and now um, I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> you, did, you did a very nice job. So as we get close to the end here, uh, Coach Montgomery found out that we were going to talk to you guys tonight, so he came up with a question for both of you guys. Nifty, the question uh, from Monty to you was, how did you manipulate the D when you were coming down on for a one-on-one -on -one and, and decide when you were going to you know, pull one of your nifty moves on them? How did you, how did you determine that is what he wanted to know. Um, I kind of knew, you know, I, I, I always thought they were pretty dumb anyways. <laughs> Did he, did he just say I played defense for the alumni? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is during our career. No, no, you can't. You can't. I, I respect some guys like Larry Robinson because he has such a reach, and it was very hard to get around him. But like I said with Barry Peterson, he would get me the puck at the right time. And in those days, you could actually slow the play down. You, you know, you didn't have to go 100 miles an hour like you do today. So if I was able to change my speeds, if I got the puck in time, the defenseman couldn't judge my speed, and he'd almost be flat-footed because he won't, doesn't want to back right in on his goalie. So if I could time it right, I would get him almost flat-footed, and then I'd have uh, you know, the ability to do pretty much whatever I wanted, to go around one way, stick the, the puck through his stick, and go the other way. And, uh, you know, if you cut to the middle, you got to have your head up because it could be detrimental to your health. But it was, <laughs> in those days, you, you hardly see one-on-one uh, -on -one anymore because the defenseman can turn and skate so well that you, it's very hard to go one-on-one -on -one and beat them clean. But in my day, some of the D, you knew one guy couldn't turn to his left, one guy couldn't turn this way, you know, the other guy couldn't turn either way, you know. <laughs> so... <laughs> well, you, you told me once you would place the puck, you'd come down on the defenseman. Usually a defenseman skating backward has one hand on his stick. He's, he's got his stick out in front like right. this. Nifty would come up to the guy and, and put the puck inside his stick in front of his feet where the guy had to look down and think about putting his other hand on the stick to play the puck. Well, the thing, was, the thing about having the puck there is defensemen are trained to watch you yeah. from the time they're six years old. Don't take your eyes off them. Don't, take it, don't look at the puck. But if you put it right here, they can see it. So, you know, very, they can't help themselves. They're like, oh, I can get it. Uh, <laughs> nope. <laughs> it works sometimes, but I got knocked down quite a bit, trust me. And Tasmani wanted to know from you how you determined when maybe the team needed a boost and an energy shift in a game, and whether that meant a fight or a hit or a scrum. How did you determine when the team needed some energy? I never went out there and fought somebody to change the complexion of the game. You know, that wasn't part of my thought process. I, I would, I would play hard and hit somebody and. If it was a, an important game or an intense game, a fight would result from that. But, you know, it's, that was part of the game. And that was so much part of the game back then. You know, if you look at the, the decrease in fighting over the last 15 or 20 years, it's amazing. I mean, when was the last time you saw a fight in an NHL hockey game? You don't see it anymore. Not very often, anyway. <laughs> uh, to finish up. What is the friendship between you two like, obviously starting when you were teammates all the way to now, Rick? Well, it, the funny thing is we uh, really didn't hang out a lot when we played. I mean, we didn't really have clicks. The whole team would go out for a beer or something to eat, and then, you know, uh, and then when you got home, you're always busy with your own families. But now, really, after the careers, my wife and, and his wife are very good friends, and, and we only live 15 minutes apart. And, uh, you know, we go over and play games and, and socialize. And then in Florida, uh, he has a place, and, and my wife and I wanted to get a place, and we wanted to be close to them, so we're within half an hour of their place. So, you know, we just always stayed together, and uh, we've been friends for a, for a long time. And we played together for a long time. 
I, my best year, I, I scored 90 points. I, he was on left wing, I was on right wing, and Jean Rattel was center ice. You know, I was like, I just, Terry, Terry, go stand in front of the net. <laughs> and, and they would shoot the puck in off my butt, off my knee, you know. They don't say how, they say how many. No. <laughs> Well, I think that's a pretty good place to finish. I want to thank Rick Middleton and Terry O'Reilly for joining us here at the Kowloon thank for you. episode three of Cue the Memories presented by Coors Banquet. <laughs>